All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, welcome to everyone coming out on this uh, rainy, rather gloomy morning, but we're going to hopefully have our spirits uplifted by the end of the two hours we spent together. Um, I'm Susan Waltz from the Ford School of Public Policy, and I'll be moderating the panel uh, this morning. Before we get started, before I introduce some of our speakers, I do want to make sure that everyone is aware that after the symposium, lunch will be served in the Kessler room downstairs, and everyone is invited to, to join for that. So um, you can put aside the rumblings of your stomach or that sort of thing and know that that can be taken care of uh, at the end of the symposium. So um, I'm not sure how many of you were able to attend the lecture last night, but we, those who were able to attend enjoyed a very stimulating uh, presentation by Radhika Kumaraswamy, and we're delighted to have a distinguished panel with us this morning to uh, pursue some of the, the questions that were raised and uh, e explore the future of humanitarianism. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce the three panelists this morning, uh, and after their comments, then I'll reintroduce uh, Radhika, uh, and we'll, we'll proceed uh, in that, that manner. So first speaking, we'll have David Kennedy from Harvard Law School. In fact, we have three distinguished law professors. Um, you've got your work cut out for you, I think, to uh, respond to the lawyers this morning. But, uh, David Kennedy, who's the Manley uh, O. Hudson Professor of Law at Harvard. He directs the Institute for Global Law and Policy there at uh, the Harvard Law School. He's written extensively about international law and global governance, including his most recent book uh, in 2016, A World of Struggle, How Power, Law, and Expertise Shaped the Global Political Economy. Uh, he's a past chair and member of the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Advisory Council on Global Governance. I don't know, David, I didn't check to see whether that means you spend your Februaries in Davos oh. or... Uh, Not anymore. <laughs> sure that um, he holds a PhD from Fletcher School, so he has diplomacy in his background as well as law. And he uses interdisciplinary materials from sociology and social theory, economics and history to explore issues of global governance, development policy, and the nature of professional expertise. He has been particularly committed to developing new voices from the third world uh, and from among women in international affairs. And with these concerns in mind, he's brought a critical perspective to humanitarian concerns with the book, Dark Sides of Virtue, Reassessing International Humanitarianism. So in a moment, I'll turn to you, but let me go ahead and right now continue to introduce the other two speakers. The second speaker will be Sam Moyne, uh, who is also at Harvard Law School, he's, where he's the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law. Um, he also has uh, credentials from uh, a different discipline, from history. Uh, he earned a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and he uh, holds that PhD as well as the law degree that he has from Harvard. His areas of interest include legal scholarship uh, in the areas of international law, human rights, the law of war, and legal thought in both historical and current perspective. He came to Harvard after 13 years at Columbia University, during which time he published the well-known history of the human rights movement the Last Utopia, Human Rights in History. His most recent book is Christian Human Rights. And our third speaker will be Steve Ratner from here at the uh, University of Michigan Law School where he is the Bruno Sema Collegiate Professor. Um, Steve teaches uh, courses in public law and uh, of the range of challenges that face governments and international institutions, uh, including territorial disputes, counterterrorism strategies, ethnic conflict, and accountability for human rights violations. Steve began his legal career as attorney advisor in the office of the legal advisor at the US State Department 
And since 2009, he served on the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Law. In 1998 and 1999, he was appointed by the UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, to a three-person group of experts to look at options for bringing the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia to justice. And then later, a decade later, in 2010 to 11, he was a member of the UN's three-person panel of experts on accountability in Sri Lanka, uh, which advised Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on human rights violations related to the end of the Sri Lankan civil war. His most recent book is The Thin Justice of International Law, A Moral Reckoning of the Law of Nations. So each of these panelists will speak for 10, 15 minutes, um, offering their comments on the, the thoughts that were put before us last evening. And then we'll um, give Radhika a chance to respond and we'll take the conversation from there. So, David. Great, well, thank you very much. I mean, I should say first, it's an incredible honor to be asked to reflect on Radhika's lecture was remarkable, very impassioned, um, terrific, and I, and I hope all of you had the chance to be there and listen. I've, I've been an ad admirer of Radhika's for many years. We discovered last night we first encountered each other in 1981, um, <laughs> uh, and it's a, really a pleasure to be asked to participate in the conversation here. There were a lot of themes raised in the, um, in the lecture, um, and lots of things we could discuss. The, a whole history of UN practice, um, the War on Terror, which had a, was a big theme in, in what Radhika brought to our attention, and the remarkable string of cases in which Radhika has been personally involved over the last 30 years. Really. So it's kind of a, a greatest hits of 20th century disasters, Radhika was there, um, and, uh, at, at, or at least what we remember as having been those disasters because she was there. Maybe that's why it is. If it, had, if it hadn't been for your accounting, um, they wouldn't be um, so central to our attention, perhaps. So, but I, what I thought I would do is reflect on a couple of themes that were raised um, and, and leave it to my colleagues to pick up on other elements rather than trying to engage such a large field. So the first theme is the question, is humanism uh, shared across all societies, which was the first big part of your lecture. And on this, I would say just um, I really don't know, um, and partly because I don't have the cross-cultural knowledge to be able to assess that kind of a question, and I also don't have the philosophical training to be confident that I know humanism when I run into it someplace. So, um, but I would say that the question of whether humanism is universal, which has preoccupied people in the human rights movement a great deal, mm. is one that's always left me with some puzzles. Um, so let me say a word about a couple of them. The first is that if you're gonna ask that question, then it seems reasonable to give humanism, which is a very complex historical achievement, at least here in the West, some kind of baseline meaning so that you know it when you encounter it. And Radhika kind of boils it down to this idea of compassion uh, with some other elements thrown in. Um, but even in the West, if we think historically, it would be a very tough assignment to boil humanism down to something because there have been so many different humanisms over the last couple of hundred years. So if we think, if, we, if we're not thinking historically, imagine we're thinking philosophically. That, and I think there are some people in philosophy departments who um, would prefer to say that humanism has been practiced in a lot of different ways. But there is a kind of philosophical essence or core that could be identified through thinking about it. Um, and I, in fact, I was at a conference here in Ann Arbor, Steve, you were there too, last fall, where there were a bunch of people trying to figure out what, what, what lies beneath human rights. And their, actually their preference was dignity rather than compassion, but whatever, I mean, some such thing. And as a more pragmatic guy, I, I must say I came away from that discussion thinking it was quite, almost phantasmagorical to imagine that there was some thing lying behind so diverse a set of historical practices or that had to be presupposed by people who were then engaging in specific activities like promoting human rights. I mean, what you can actually see and engage is a practice. Um, it could be a practice of dignity or a practice of compassion or a practice of human rights. 
And as I see it, there's nothing lurking behind it. It's, it is what it is. Um, it's a practice people engage in for some purpose to accomplish something. And of course you don't find the whole European Enlightenment practice anywhere else. I mean, it's, I mean in Radhika, you described it in great detail. It's a, the 20th century human rights norms and institutions and professions were a very specific historical achievement um, that wasn't done anywhere else. And they were not just the enlightenment expressed in some way. They were, and they didn't happen everywhere. They happened because particular people did things to move things around and develop institutions of a particular kind. Um, so is humanism universal? I'm not sure. I mean, the real question is, what is the significance of this specific set of practices for the world um, as we think about it today? And I do agree with Radhika that it's really important to resurrect the legacy of participation of scholars and activists from the global south in the history of the United Nations and in the history of the development of what specifically became the human rights movement, um, as well as in international law more generally. So it's, it's certainly true that the human rights movement was not a product of nine guys sitting around in the North Atlantic thinking, but of a very specific set of interactions between people in the decolonization moment and thereafter and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of excellent new work analyzing contributions from the South to international law more generally as well as to human rights. I'm thinking of Arnold Becker's book on what he calls mestizo, mestizo international law. The thing that's interesting is that what people find when they do that is pluralism. Not a shared thing common everywhere, but a multiple set of international laws created and utilized for different purposes in different places. And Sally Engelmary, whose work you um, refer to, uh, who writes about the vernacularization of human rights, uh, also provides evidence of a multiplicity of practices as people all over the place grab on to things they think will be useful in their project. Mm -hmm. and, and as a way, in a way, I think that's what we kind of expect with a complicated project like Human Rights First, that people, let's say from the West, who were promoting human rights, would pick up anything they could use in some local cultural tradition and say, yeah, let's go with that. And people in the various places would pick up what they could use out of what was available internationally and make of it what they could make of it. And what you'd end up with um, are a whole series of very specific practices that would have some overlaps. Uh, people writing letters, that would be a hot thing to do in Germany. People building institutions and NGOs, that would be great wherever the Ford Foundation had money. So you'd have different faces of the thing in a variety of different places. And as this would happen, the practice would get ever more historically specific, not ever more universal that even if it became more widespread, it would become more particularized. One might even think of that as good, that it was a virtue that a liberation project or emancipation project would not have a universal face or even have make a universal claim about itself, but would make a, a claim about its usefulness in a variety of different places. And in each place, you'd have to ask you know, who had helped and who had hurt. Uh, and if it was a good thing or a bad thing, as my grandma always used to ask me whenever I would tell her about something wonderful. Um, so that's the first puzzle. And the, the second puzzle is um, in this humanism is universal idea is that, I mean, if you think about the world, it's not even slightly plausible that humanism is the only universal value. I mean, obviously violence, greed, selfishness are also universal values. And people everywhere think unfathomable justice is okay and part of the human condition and something they can accept in one or another way. <coughs> and people everywhere think that terror and torture and war are tolerable and might be useful. Um, and so also the denial of healthcare and the denial of housing and the denial of nourishment, they are everywhere part of what people also think of as values or as the unfortunate consequences of other values that have to be respected or whatever. So I guess what I, what's, what I think people mean when they say humanism is everywhere is something like everywhere, something that sort of resembles humanism, is an emancipatory promise that might be helpful. And I think that's possible. Um, in which case, as an emancipatory promise or project, you'd think the, the question would be a very practical one. Does it work? 
I mean, what can be achieved and at what cost can it be achieved? And those are usually extremely site-specific questions. I mean, it, 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 in, in, in asking a site-specific question like that, it's not clear how the universalism or not of humanism really matters. Right. I mean, if it is universal, but it's ineffective and limited, then let's junk it. Um, but if it's not universal, but it works everywhere, okay, let's do it. I mean, so what if it's not universal? It's emancipatorily practical. Um, and in this you could say, well, universality might be itself a tactical question. Maybe saying something is universal makes it work better. And I think a lot of human rights advocates, when they say human rights is universal, they are trying to pump it up. But it seems that would all depend. I mean, it's equally likely to make it seem less useful. If you come into somewhere with a very specific set of questions and you say, yes, but this is universal, they might think, well, thank you, but that's not what we need. What we need is something that's more specific to our situation. Um, so, you know, it's going to function some places and not function in other places. All that said, I think the serious question that's raised by the universalism issue that Radhika also raises and we should worry about is the, the subaltern problem, that it's voices that can't be spoken and can't be heard, and what do we do about that, and how do we think about that? And I suppose universalism could mean that the cultural parallels to our way of approaching emancipation are sufficient that we don't need other voices. Human rights has inherited what we need from all these traditions, and the subaltern doesn't need to speak because we have got it from their cultural tradition in some way. And I wouldn't go that far, and I don't think, Radhika, you would either. Um, I, I mean, I do worry, and I think you do too, about lost human potentials and alternatives. Mm -hmm. about, uh, there, but that also seems a practical rather than a philosophical problem. Is there crowding out? Does the promotion of human rights or the extension of Western humanist institutions and practices crowd out other promise, promising traditions for emancipation? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, but it's hard to see how it could not crowd other things out. I mean, all that money and institutional focus and professional training and diplomatic machinery, I mean, certainly in an area I know a little bit more about in economic development, as the idea of economic development became a kind of universal terrain for political discussion, it did crowd out other topics that post-colonial states might have thought were important elements in their political imagination. Mm -hmm. And I'd be surprised if that wasn't also true of human rights. It must be true. So that was the first theme, universalism. Um, the second theme I'd like to reflect a little bit on is um, the question, how should we evaluate the recent practices of human rights work by the UN? Um, and here I think maybe, maybe Steve, you'll have more to say about that, and I'm not going to speak too much about it. But my framework, I think, is basically the same one as Radhika. It's a very pragmatic, a pragmatism that I think you share. Mm -hmm. You approach human rights not by asking if they're right, either philosophically and theoretically or historically, but to figure out what works. So, I mean, the question whether they're theoretically right, maybe they have a theoretical fatal flaw, but they still work. So, okay, let's keep using them. I mean, lots of things have theoretical fatal flaws and we're function just fine. Um, or it could be that historically and culturally they're imperialist, but, you know, they're splendid tools of emancipation. Well, then whatever about being imperialist. Um, so the idea would be to evaluate the consequences of good ideas. And I think Radhika illustrates this when she thinks about naming and shaming and says, you know, there's some downsides. The, the shaming idea arises in situations that often are detrimental um, for women in many cultures. Uh, so naming and shaming is not only a virtuous practice, it's aligned with a lot of other practices that can reinforce questions of dignity and shame that may be not what you want in some place. And I think um, on the upside, Radhika takes a very pragmatic view when she says, you know, all those UN rapporteur reports might not have changed anything, but they did serve as a kind of what she calls keeper of historical memory. So a kind of surprising upside to the collection of all of those materials that you described also yesterday. So, and here I think it would be extremely difficult to think pragmatically and evaluate the global practice of human rights as a whole. I mean, doubtless there are lots of upsides and downsides. And um, surely it worked in some places and created havoc in other places. 
Um, but there are certainly things I worry about. I mean, I worry about the way human rights has gotten so tangled up with war. Um, I worry that way, about the way human rights people and projects can seem indifferent to inequality and distributional concerns. Um, um, I, I worry about the way it tends to define justice as having an appropriate relationship with your state as an individual. Um, I mean, that is a kind of a narrow frame, but I mean, have to, those are worries to be assessed, not killer mm. flaws in the thing. Mm. Um, and you bring this approach to your analysis of R2P and international criminal law and, um, and criminal accountability, the whole no impunity idea. Um, so an advertisement for a recent book um, by Karen Engel and Zena Miller on the turns of no impunity just came out this year. Mm. Very interesting. And my intuition, and also the intuition of that book, is a lot less optimistic than, than yours, Radhika. I mean, I, I mean, it is odd for human rights to call so insistently on the state and the military and international interveners and so on. I get the impulse to want to do it. Um, but whether this is emancipatory depends, as you said in the lecture, on when and where it's done, by whom, how it's controlled, and so forth. And those. Uh, what happens when it's promised but actually not delivered? And those questions very rarely seem to me to have very positive answers. They, they might, it's not that they couldn't, but the one argument in favor of all that that I've, I'm a little allergic to is the idea that they don't now but someday they will. So the idea that they prefigure something that's better in some future historical moment. It, you know, international criminal justice is terribly unfair right now. It catches random people in its net and it's all focused on Africa. But someday, if we keep going, I, I as a, I mean, that kind of gets entangled with my human rights sensibility because it's always an argument for the violation of human rights that it's got some promising future thing. Mm -hmm. We need to deny justice right now because it's an emergency, but that way we'll be able to get somewhere else. So it's got something of the very thing it's against in it. Anyway, so that's that. The last theme that I want to talk about, um, that I'll mention very briefly, is the last third of Radhika's uh, lecture, where she warns about the unfortunate consequences of intellectual critiques of human rights. So, I mean, I agree, I agree that um, criticism, like anything else, ought to be evaluated pragmatically. I mean, if you read Nietzsche and Althusser and Foucault, and that really does have the effect of taking a whole generation of progressive young people away from human rights activity, as you say, I mean, I'd be worried. We'd need to figure out what did they do instead? Was that actually better? What else was going on? And so forth. Um, and I think Radhika is right that human rights has been retrenching. The glory days of the late 20th century have, are behind us. We don't know its future. Um, people are attracted by other emancipatory projects. They want to change the world with local politics or by developing a new app for their phone or by religion. Or they want to change the world in lots of different ways. But I wouldn't blame the French social theorists. I mean, <laughs> I mean a lot's happened in the last. Um, in the last 20 years, and I don't think you can invalidate or prove human rights with a theory. I think what you can do with a theory is suggest things that people with a practical sensibility ought to consider. So I don't read these French guys as offering slam dunk silver, bu silver bullets that destroy the human rights movement. Uh, or the Enlightenment, or liberalism, or humanism, or whatever. I, I read them as kind of cautionary warning stories. So this is a question, you're interested in doing good in the world, how should you read Foucault now? Um, so I think, I mean, let's take a couple of the guys that Radhika mentions, Nietzsche. So Radhika says he sees slave morality as a consistent part of modern life. Well, yeah, I mean, that's an important thing to take into account. Maybe we can learn something. Maybe the focus on victims and victimization and victim agency and recompense and so forth has some downsides. And we may still want to turn people who've been harmed into victims for various purposes, but we'd have to attend to those difficulties. Uh, or Althusser, who you spend more time discussing in the lecture, and you credit him with, or blame him, I'm not sure, with taking the focus off individualism, with preferring local to universal forms of justice, with denying the significance or importance of any ideal order, with opposing 
progressive narratives of necessity in history um, with drawing attention to the ideological fabric within which people develop emancipatory ideas. He had he did a long list of things like I did. I mean, he's got a bill of particulars. Um, <laughs> but it seems like those are all actually very useful things when you think about it. Um, if you want to be a human rights activist, maybe you'd go ahead, but you'd want to think about it. So um, maybe the focus on individualism has been taken too far. Maybe the idea of prefiguring an ideal order it's not the best way to talk about the future forms of justice. Maybe it becomes too much of an iron cage for our imagination. Maybe having a kind of progressive narrative of history of the unfolding of justice gives us too necessitarian an idea about our own projects. And we ought to be, you know, gets us to be too self-confident that we're riding history's way. We ought to be a little careful about that. So I, so I would read Althusser as cautionary not um, debilitating. Um, or take Foucault. I mean, I think I hear Radica's chastened or really anguished conclusion. I want my reason back, as you said <laughs> yesterday. I mean, me too. I'd hate to lose reason. I don't really, <laughs> As an old person, I worry about that all the time. Um, but I don't read Foucault as foundationally undermining reason. I read him as in a much more sociological and diagnostic way. I mean, institutions do discipline people. Um, knowing this rather than that is an exercise of power. Modes of government and governance do have a way of mobilizing institutions and ideas beyond those we first look at. And, and so all those things are kind of helpful cautions. Mm -hmm. If we want to start a project to change the governance practices of the world, mm -hmm. and I mean that's what human rights is about. Mm -hmm. Human rights is not some small little corner operation. Mm -hmm. It's a brave new world kind of project. Mm -hmm. Transforming rulership worldwide. Well, so if you're going to do that, it's good to understand how governance works in all its difficulties. How knowledge becomes power, how modes of discipline become ways of knowing, including knowing what humanism requires, what human rights are. Uh, and I think part of what's chastened the human rights movement over the last 20 years has been encountering governance. So a kind of we've met the rulers and they're us kind of experience mm -hmm. uh, out in the field in all kinds of different places. And I mean, we would all have stories about that, I think. Mm -hmm. And that can chasten a person um, when you realize that you're exercising power rather than just writing letters. Mm -hmm. um, now, I should say here at the end, Radhika mentioned me yesterday very generously for a book about the dark sides of um, humanitarian activities. And I should say, in that book, I, I don't feel, and you didn't read me this way either, as offering a critique of human rights, no. but rather a whole list of worries. So these are considerations to take into account, a lot of which I kind of came up with by reading these social theoretical people and thinking, OK, if I was a practical person, what would I worry about if I was engaging on an emancipatory project worldwide? How can this help me to do that? Um, and it seems to me irresponsible of people who want to exercise power not to take that stuff into account and not to try to figure that out as best one can. And it's a long list of worries, ultimately, that attend human rights activism now. But I mean, it's a long list of promised benefits, too. So we wouldn't expect that a governance project that ambitious wouldn't bring along an equally long list of pitfalls that needed to be somehow dealt with. I mean, you know, remaking health care in the United States turns out to be complex. Even the president figured that out. Um, but imagine the project of remaking governance worldwide. A lot of eggs would have to be broken in order to do that. And so the, I guess I'll just conclude by saying I'm glad there are people like Radhika who are making the omelet. Um, and you should keep on doing it. We're in good hands. Thank you very much. Okay, well, it's a privilege to be part of this discussion. I should warn Susan that I was told to prepare 20 minutes of remarks, but if you'd no, like to have them off, feel free. You're absolutely fine. So, so I've been doing some historical research on how human rights fit in the history of distributive ideals. And I was paging through an old report uh, uh, the other day about a 1978 UNESCO conference about human rights 
basic needs and the establishment of what was then called the New International Economic Order, and it met in Paris in 1978, and lo and behold, on the last page, it leapt out at me that Radhika Kumaraswamy oh. was there. <laughs> now, this was 40 years ago almost, uh, and the, the, what we call the human rights movement was ascending fast in the world's consciousness. So her career has accompanied that development, I think in ways that are admirable and extraordinary. But I think in the end, she's right to ask whether in spite of what the movement has done, we need to save it and ourselves from some of its shortcomings. And that's the spirit of my remarks. So I'm also gonna begin with Erotica's appeals to a humanism beyond space and time because it just, they seem to me to be a non-starter. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to cite Michel Foucault in this regard. Um, he was on firm ground when he talked about humanism late in his life and observed that those appeals to humanism, these are his words, have varied greatly in their content. In the 17th century, there was a humanism that presented itself as a critique of Christianity or religion in general, and there was a Christian humanism opposed to an ascetic and much more theocentric humanism. In the 19th century, there was a suspicious humanism that was hostile and critical towards science, and another that, on the contrary, placed its hope in that same science. Marxism has been a humanism, so have existentialism and personalism. There was a time, this is all still Foucault, when people supported the humanistic values represented by national socialism, and when the Stalinists of themselves said they were humanists, all true. I'll just add a homelier example that playing the devil in one of his films, Al Pacino insists that he is a humanist. <laughs> so the question about all these humanists is what we should infer from the fact that everyone seems to say they are one. Uh, and in fact, historians have shown that the very multitude of claims on humanism generated the attacks on humanism that Radica doesn't like. Now, Foucault, I think, drew a very reasonable conclusion from this proliferation of humanism. So let me give his words some attention again. From this, he writes, we shouldn't conclude that everything that has ever been linked with humanism is to be rejected, but that the humanistic thematic is itself too supple, too diverse, too inconsistent to serve as an axis for reflection. Uh, Humanists always lean on religion, science, or politics uh, and justify conceptions uh, from those other sources. So let me again put it in a simpler way. If you tell me that you're a humanist, you haven't yet told me what you are for. You say you're relying on humanism, but you're for something else, and you have to tell us what it is. Now, Radhika is for human rights, and I just don't see it as workable to say that these ideas, as we know them now, are part of a common stock of wisdom uh, to be found in all times and wherever you go. I only can say anything about Western intellectual history, uh, but within it, the values we call human rights now have been articulated very rarely, let alone honored within it. No condemnation of the practices of slavery or torture are to be found in the annals until a few centuries ago, and patriarchy waited longer still. And then we get the rest of the world, and I'll just be much stronger than David on this point, that it doesn't seem like the things that Roddick has said yesterday about humanism can survive the introduction to anthropology class taught here and elsewhere. Now, all that's to say that I don't believe that it serves human rights universalism, of which I'm a partisan within some limits, to deny that there are controversial values in world history. I myself would link them, um, if we're thinking of them as a package, to a specific vision of modernity uh, that's won out amongst a few people uh, in some places and at some times. I disagree with David, emancipation itself is a very recent uh, moral conception. Now this is not to say that some human rights uh, aren't age old. Every culture we know of honors the value of life, even when they don't propound an individual entitlement to it. Uh, every culture we know 
uh, says that there are exceptions when it's illicit to impose death. But to say something like this is just to say that of all the universalisms that have teamed and tangled with each other in history, there's lots of overlap. Uh, the Sanskrit scholar uh, Sheldon Pollock remarks in his writing, there has not been just one cosmopolitanism in history, but several. And if that's right, then the interesting fact is that for all the overlap amongst different humanisms that have appeared in the plural in world history, the interesting fact isn't that they've converged but competed and sometimes battled to the death. What was the Cold War, after all, but a contest of universalism? Some people believe, and maybe not wrongly, that Christianity and Islam, neither one less or more humanistic than human rights are, have been in contest with each other long since and are still today. Now, I think, Radhika, I can agree that human rights as we know them now, overlap with and resonate with worldwide cultural norms. But you can't fail to add that they never do so precisely. Uh, and there's more often conflict. OK, so that takes me back to that UNESCO conference. Uh, what global human rights, our humanism, were even going to be about was an open question that recently. Now. Radhika insists that the United Nations has been the steward of human rights, uh, and no one denies that claim to the best of my knowledge. Um, but I want to give a somewhat more critical account of the United Nations. It's certainly true that the organization was the steward of, of international human rights for the first third of their history, but it's also where human rights went to die. Uh, and it took a series of far-flung movements to reclaim the idea from its original entombment in the United Nations. So I think Radhika and I will disagree most on this point. Uh, as a faithful UN actor, she seems to believe that the UN is generally a progressive and important uh, actor. I think it depends. And often uh, the re uh, reverse is closer to the truth. So the UN's formation in 1945 ratified an interstate order and a predominance of great powers that don't rule out other impulses, but make them generally dependent on and unthreatening to the rule of, by, and for the states, which is what the UN is <coughs> uh, And of course, this has to include the modicum of human rights enforcement that has a very slowly grown up over the last decade. So Roddick is right that there's a rare case in which a state can become a pariah to its peers uh, and is too weak to avoid the consequences. From South Africa, very slowly again to other cases. Um, but notwithstanding this, I don't think the UN has been the primary human rights actor in recent history. Uh, Radhika also touted, you heard, the promise of the ideal of the responsibility to protect. But she didn't mention that the most recent pariah, Muammar Gaddafi's Libya, had its regime change after the Security Council first cited the doctrine of R2P. And China and Russia have since signaled their intention not to be fooled again. And lots of Syrian civilians have suffered in consequence. Now, I think it's very important to add to this skeptical account that when international enforcement of human rights relies on obscure bureaucracies, or independent experts, even though they're appointed by states, um, in roles such as uh, what we call special procedures or treaty bodies, the results are, are stirring. And Radhika's career has brilliantly illustrated this point. But if you're looking for what she called a progressive story uh, about the history of human rights activism, I would want to point to all of those groups that have tried to reclaim human rights from the United Nations. Although we then have to know that the incidents and especially the funding for those groups have never been equally distributed across the globe. And just because these movements now come closer to ordinary people than in the early history of the UN hardly means that activism doesn't intersect 
great power agendas in very intricate ways, especially since this country, the United States, uh, learned to tell itself that it was founded on the idea of human rights. And uh, around the same time as human rights activism exploded, uh, began to um, uh, organize its foreign policy in part around human rights. However, I, I, so I wanna, um, uh, in spite of my skepticism about the UN, um, make some room for, more room for non-governmental activism, which compared to the UN, even though NGOs um, are selective and strategic, even though they're usually ineffective or weak, do, because they're non-governmental, have a point of distinction um, over governmental enforcement. And it's actually uh, that they hew to a virtue that Foucault, uh, once again, if you read him, championed. It was the virtue of speaking the truth, or what uh, Foucault called parhesia. Now, um, I uh, think that these movements have been some of the most uplifting phenomena to appear in, in the moral history of, of, of humanity in recent times. And yet, I think it's wrong for them to speak up for their ideals on the grounds that they're contentious, not that everyone already believes in them. And I think they should avoid ventriloquizing for helpless victims, as if it were obvious what they want, uh, as if uh, they might not have some humanisms of their own to offer us. Now, humanists have always claimed to speak for victims. Christians did. Uh, that's what outraged Nietzsche when Christians spoke for the meek. Socialists spoke for the wretched of the earth. Uh, and human rights activists are only the most recent to ventriloquize contentious ideals through the claim that victims already want them. I think they should uh, not speak for victims. Uh, and I actually really like the moment in Radhika's uh, presentation where she, sh she suggested that the UN should make more room for victims' voices, but then we have to insist that we not anticipate what they want or say. Um, so that's my view of the human rights movement. It's a recent phenomenon, it's contentious, it's caught up in power dynamics, uh, and then we have to ask, more realistically, where has it been since that 1978 meeting? I think it would be surprising sitting in UNESCO in Paris in 1978 what the human rights movement has turned out to look like. Um, and I want to dwell on this in conclusion in two main respects. Acknowledging that there might not just have been breakthroughs, but bad mistakes and wrong turns. And if that's so, we should talk a lot less about humanism uh, and more about what sort of contentious movement to have. Um, I don't think French intellectuals are to blame for where the human rights movement has gone. The human rights movement is. And so in conclusion, uh, precisely because Roddick is so um, correct to say the human rights movement needs to be resurrected, let me focus on two areas to which David also alluded, war and distribution. So in 1978, movements were at the beginning of calling for a new human right to peace, which actually figured in those meetings all those years ago. And the human right to peace was a prominent feature of human rights activism in the 1980s. Uh, E.P. Thompson, if you're interested in a famous example, a champion the right to peace in his peace work. And it wasn't implausible to do so, because even though human rights had not been very well known in the 1940s, they were connected in the beginning to the ideal of peace. No wonder northern citizens whose states founded the United Nations, by and large, had lived through two world wars that affected them. But what's happened since? Well, since 9-11, I think, to be very blunt about it, we've seen the repurposing of human rights for the humanization of endless war. It's a war that doesn't affect northern citizens very much, even though it's fought in their name. And it's a genuinely global conflict, unlike the so-called world wars for the first time. The United States uh, had special operations activity in fully three quarters of all countries last year. Now, there was a choice made, I think, between 
Roddick is meeting and today to depacify human rights. Activist Lauren Roddick explained uh, of her own life and with some reluctance to justify war in the name of human rights, but much more important, human rights were chosen as a tool of choice to try to restrain hegemonic actors in world affairs. So people uh, turned after 9-11s rarely against war but they were livid about torture uh, from a sense of weakness, maybe. Indicting wartime violations, not war itself, provided what seemed to be a more strategic basis for criticism. Uh, Radhika, I think, very persuasively complained about drones, but note that she did so on grounds of the collateral damage they caused to civilians, even though drones have made war more humane even though, though the war on terror has been the most humane war ever fought in history. The deeper syndrome of which drones are a symptom is war, uh, if you like, sans frontières. Uh, it now doesn't have borders geographically, and it has no end in time. The forever war crosses boundaries heedless of rules on the use of force or perverting their meaning. Within human rights movements, however, a choice was made, principled or strategic, right or wrong, to not engage in anti-war activism. That was another movement that didn't exist. But human rights activism beckoned. It won indubitable victories, but with paradoxical effects because it made war more humane yet and potentially harder to rein in. No one speaks about a human right to peace anymore. Now, would human rights movements have been better positioned to oppose the global explosion of force after 9-11 if they hadn't spent the 1990s recovering from pacifism in order to urge the use of force for humanitarian purposes? For that matter, what are the costs of consolidating human rights and humanitarian law to have human rights ideals turn global military violence into humane global policing. That's what Radhika said she was for. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that the price is, of this choice has been too high to pay. I am suggesting that restricting the stigma of endless war to George W. Bush or pinning the blame on Michel Foucault are both <laughs> evasions. Now let me turn to my last topic, distribution, mainly because Radhika didn't mention it in her otherwise comprehensive lecture, and because that 1978 meeting was all about distribution. In particular, how to connect the human rights idea with so-called basic needs and development, and how to make both connect with worldwide egalitarian distribution. Now what mattered, just for some perspective, mainly after World War II to most people, it wasn't that the great powers founded the UN, or that some people wrote the Universal Declaration in response to the Holocaust, which is a myth that Erotica repeated. Instead, it's that people around the world embraced the national welfare state uh, as their highest uh, project. It had the goal uh, from nation to nation of setting up a sufficient floor of protection for all citizens, sometimes called social rights as well as a modicum of egalitarian distribution. Now, the Global South was excluded largely from this development, but it engaged in decolonization to get it, to get the globalization of the national welfare state, albeit without comparable success. That new international economic order, so-called, on which Roddick had deliberated all those years ago, was an attempt to ask for a globally egalitarian order. Uh, without forgetting about sufficiency needs uh, that weren't served very well, either by the early post-colonial state or by global development to that point. What happened since, you might ask, since that meeting? Well, very briefly, distributive equality died as an ideal and at every scale. Uh, this has to be put into view because the human rights movement is the world historical companion 
of what my old colleague named Mark Mazower has called the real new international economic order of neoliberalism. So today, some of our leading uh, philosophers tend to exist, insist on the priority or exclusive importance of thresholds of distributive entitlement, not distributive equality, or change the subject away from distributional equality altogether. They might uh, remember um, uh, philosophers like Thomas Paine, who wrote in a, a book, Agrarian Justice, these are his words, that he cares not how affluent some may be so long as none be miserable in consequence of it. So in that view, material inequality doesn't matter so long as everyone is brought to a sufficiency threshold. And that's the spirit of human rights, too. Uh, distributive equality was taken off the table as an ideal and often reversed in practice. And human rights movements have fit well in an era of history concerned primarily about social or status inequality. Uh, you might say it's been an age in which the politics of recognition have prevailed over the politics of redistribution. And yet, and yet, we're learning that even if you don't think it's unethical, um, material equality still matters to some people. People in Detroit and Flint justifiably claim a basic sufficiency right to water. But nowhere more than Michigan and a few other states nearby can we justifiably conclude that a politics that humanizes neoliberal inequality is not just unjust, but also unsustainable. Now, given what I said before, it would be risky for me to put words in the mouth of the, of the white male working class of the industrial Midwest, uh, although they generally don't need a basic floor of minimum provision. Uh, but we know, I think, that they've correlated the crisis of the overall income and wealth distribution curve with their own sense of aggrieved identity. And it would be hard to conclude pragmatically if that's how what we're going to be talking about. That without some modicum of distributional equality, human rights for our fellow citizens, and especially for strangers, are unlikely to be forthcoming. Now that's about national inequality, but consider also global inequality, which has never been a dominant concern of the era of human rights governance and movements, which watch uh, proposals like the New International Economic Order shipwreck and went on to pursue other things. So like a world of endless war, I would worry, human rights movements have seemed to make peace with a persistently unequal order. And they have neither the arguments nor the desire nor the power to shake it. Okay, so I'm going to finish. Um, I loved Radhika's talk, but I don't see it as possible to separate the agenda of saving the depressing world with human rights from the agenda of saving human rights from the depressing world, or else the agenda of looking for some better ideals and tools. In world historical perspective, it is early days yet for the human rights phenomenon. Few regard human rights yet uh, as another god that has failed. Christians spent millennia uh, hoping Jesus would return to redeem them, including from their own disappointing churches. For decades, Marxists promised their own humanisms to save themselves from the realities of Bolshevism before finally giving up socialism. Now, to avoid such a fate for human rights, in, in my own personal opinion, uh, human rights should recede in importance. Um, more and more, we have to begin by registering their inapplicability to many of our worst problems. As for humanism, we may need a, a version of it uh, that no one yet has propounded to avoid the devil's work. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, Susan for the very kind introduction and um, I also consider it a great honor to be here to be part of the Tanner Lecture Symposium and comment on uh, Radhika's uh, lecture from yesterday. 
Um, it really was a magnificent um, lecture that spanned the history and practice and theory of human rights, um, yet also showed her own intellectual transformation and brought in her own experiences. Um, I particularly liked her characterization of the four phases of international human rights law and the recognition that human rights, law, human rights are violated not merely by states but by armed groups and other actors like corporations and, um, and even religious groups. Um, the architecture that she described has both crown jewels and fool's gold. Um, within the UN, the crown jewels are some of the special rapporteur and special representative positions created by the Commission and the Council and by the SG, uh, some of the human rights courts and compliance and standard setting treaty bodies, um, and investigatory works of bodies that she's been part of. Uh, the Fool's Gold includes some of the smoke and mirrors of certain debates within and resolutions of the Human Rights Council. Um, and then there are things in the middle like UPR, um, which have put members in the spotlight, but we don't really know the results at this point. Um, my remarks today attempt to build on her emphasis, um, the emphasis in her remark about the so-called vernacularization of human rights. Um, but whereas uh, Radhika's talk focused on the need to translate and contextualize human rights norms, universal norms, to make them meaningful for victims, um, I'd like to focus on the conveyor belt linking the norms with the other side of the violation, namely with the violators, uh, to whom human rights law may be quite threatening. And in particular, I'd like to talk about the role of persuasion and politics in trying to get violators to change course and follow international norms. Now, Radhika knows better than anyone else about the role of persuasion in politics because she was in the eye of the storm, uh, both in Sri Lanka and in the UN system, constantly appealing to recalcitrant actors to respect the rules of human rights law and humanitarian law um, that are, in my view, generally accepted. Um, and she emphasized repeatedly the role of dialogue, and that's what I'd like to, again, expand upon. Um, I've had um, a chance to see this process at work myself, um, both in, in a variety of institutional settings, starting at the State Department, but I also have worked for the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. Um, I've worked for the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I was on the two expert panels that, um, that Sue mentioned regarding the Khmer Rouge and the Sri Lankan Civil War. Um, as a theoretical matter, um, our understanding of persuasion has benefited from significant scholarship on within mostly political science and psychology, uh, where students of persuasion have examined how international actors can change the mind or at least the behavior of others. Um, but the bulk of this work has not really focused on the process of persuasion when it comes to respect for international legal rules. And based on the theoretical literature and some of my own lived experiences and those of others that I have spoken to over the years, I think um, international um, actors, both governmental, non-governmental, international organizations, um, are, can be grouped together into a, um, um, a category or, or a term that I would call normative intermediaries, um, who engage in a strategy of communication with violators. Um, how does that strategy get decided? Well, some of the factors are beyond the intermediary's control. Um, who are the violators that she's interacting with? Um, they can have different goals. They can have different internal structures, different ways of enforcing their views on those who work with them and work for them. The violations can be different. Um, they can take place in a prison. They can take place on the battlefield. They can involve disappearances, sexual violence, arbitrary killing. Um, and I'd refer you, by the way, to a wonderful book by uh, a former student of mine here in Joe called Compliant Rebels, where she explains how some armed groups actually are quite good at complying with the rules of international humanitarian law. Um, but the strategy that these intermediaries use um, is also going to depend on certain more endogenous factors, like the intermediary's identity. Um, how does he or she perceive herself or himself? Does she represent an international organization like the UN, um, as Radhika has, an NGO like Amnesty International, like Sue has, or someone in the middle, like the International Committee of the Red Cross? And of course, the institutional context matters a great deal for the communication strategy. Are we trying to persuade a violator in a political body in a private one-on-one -on -one communication? Um, 
When these factors are taken into account, these normative inter intermediaries like Radica and others deploy quite sophisticated arguments to try to get actors to change their behavior. Um, these arguments vary in a number of ways. Um, they vary in terms of their publicity. Um, they, an NGO might make a very public appeal. The ICRC will make a very confidential appeal. They can vary in terms of their tone. Sometimes the intermediary will be what, want to be quite confrontational. And sometimes the intermediary will be want, to, want to be quite conciliatory. But for me, um, and this resonates with Radhika's speech yesterday, the key trait in the, in the strategy of persuasion, and the one where politics plays the greatest role, is the intermediary's choice of whether to invoke legal obligations directly, to use what we might call law talk as opposed to something else. For the goal of the intermediary, I think, is to change the violator's behavior to conform with the rules of humanitarian and human rights law. And sometimes that means avoiding reciting the treaties and their language of obligation, um, a form of persuasion that's, of course, completely at odds with what courts or treaty monitoring bodies do. Um, instead, the intermediary uses what's best seen as strategic argumentation. Now, to give you an example of strategic argumentation, we can look at the Red Cross. Um, the Geneva-based quasi-international organization responsible for the compliance with IHL. Um, a noble project, um, in my view, uh, given the reality of war, and one um, whose um, work, I think, is, is highly valuable. Um, of course, many of their interlocutors are non-state actors, non-state armed groups, who are suspicious of international law because they regard it as made by states to weaken them. Um, and as a result, when the ICRC delegates sit down with a armed group and try to persuade them not to kidnap people, not to rape women, not to enslave children, um, not to do the other things that happen in wartime, um, they rely on other arguments besides reciting to them the Geneva Conventions or protocols. Um, they rely on humanitarian arguments that if they change their behavior, it will reduce the suffering of people. They rely on political arguments that if they change their behavior, their reputation will improve. They rely on economic arguments that if they change their behavior, they'll get more revenue of some kind. They rely on pragmatic arguments that if they change their behavior, they'll actually be a more effective fighting body. They rely, of course, on moral arguments that changing their behavior is the right thing to do because of what a decent military should do. And they will rely on customary arguments like the ones that Radhika talked about yesterday that the customs and mores of their society demand respect, for instance, for civilians or for prisoners. Um, these choices um, require people who are savvy enough on the political side and not just legal experts. Indeed, I'd argue that the choices about which communication strategy to deploy are actually more important in terms of persuasion than whether the norm is a hard law norm, like something in a treaty, or a soft law norm, like something the High Commissioner or the Human Rights Council may have passed in a resolution. Um, so in Tom Frank's words, the compliance poll depends as much, if not more, on the strategy of communication as it does on the internal traits of the norm. Now, I can't prove to the satisfaction of a quantitatively oriented political scientist that this framework describes how persuasion works. Um, when it comes to uh, compliance with legal norms, but I can share at least two examples from my work with the Sri Lanka panel of experts, um, which as um, Sue mentioned, was charged with looking into the allegations during the last phase of the civil war in Sri Lanka and making recommendations to the government. Um, the first uh, little story, um, during our work, a number of NGOs, including Tamil ex exile groups, um, told us that our recommendations for accountability of those who ordered and carried out atrocities on Tamil civilians should include asking the Security Council to refer the situation to the International Criminal Court. And there was certainly a good argument to, in favor of asking the Council to do that. Yet our panel did not include this in our recommendation. We never even mentioned the ICC. Um, why? Because a proposal calling for an ICC investigation of Sri Lanka's leaders would have instantly made our report impossible for civil society in Sri Lanka to endorse, our, to endorse without being regarded as unpatriotic. And their support was, of course, critical for our report, which was an exercise in persuasion, to have a domestic impact. Um, 
So our recommendation for a full domestic investigation was grounded in international law, but a form of strategic argumentation. Second story is a lesson on the limits of persuasion. Um, the Sri Lankan government refused to allow our panel to visit the country, but at the end of our work, they sent a delegation from Colombo to meet with us. At one point, uh, one of our colleagues from the UN tried a direct invocation of legal norms to a Sri Lankan interlocutor who, in theory, one might have thought would be the most amenable to hearing it, the Attorney General, a man who had done uh, graduate work at Harvard Law School, no less. Um, the UN official mentioned to the Attorney General that a proposed law requiring the singing of the national anthem in Sinhalese, the majority's language, was inconsistent with international human rights standards, including minority rights standards. And the response from the Attorney General was a spewing forth of the most cynical, manipulative argument to claim that it was normal practice of states to require the national anthem be sung in the national language. Quoting Radhika from yesterday, handmaiden of the apparatus of dominance right in front of us. Well, it was a hymn, not a handmaiden, <laughs> a handmaster perhaps. Um, so sometimes the problem is not finding the right argument, but discovering that the other side is not willing to listen or change its position. So persuasion has its limits, and this takes me back to Radhika's lecture. And when it does, I believe politics has an even greater role to play, because it's at that point that those concerned with compliance have to begin the name and shame process and increase the cost of non-compliance through sanctions and demands for accountability. But I guess, um, contrary to Sam here, I think that this process, uh, that the central uh, actors in this process are states um, engaged in political action. Um, now, even as I talk about the role of states in enforcing human rights, we run into the question of double standards that Radhika talked about yesterday. Um, to wit, isn't the political arena less legitimate or effective a forum for ending violations as opposed to human rights courts or treaty mechanisms where politics plays a lesser role and decisions are supposedly based on the impartial application of legal rules? Isn't the Council's paralysis on Syria or the Human Rights Council's, the, the Security Council's paralysis on Syria or the Human Rights Council's selective agenda when it comes to passing resolutions of condemnation exhibit A of the dangers of too much politics when it comes to human rights compliance. Now, as an initial matter, I would very much agree with Radhika that the double standard critique is a broad and often unsophisticated criticism, one that ignores the fact that law is routinely enforced domestically, not primarily by courts, but by politically accountable actors. In a rather simple example, the fact that prosecutors give some murderers plea bargains and bring others to trial is certainly not on its own enough to call the legal system illegitimate. But more importantly, the concern with double standards neglects the question of the effectiveness of political enforcement. <coughs> Namely, regardless of the school of international relations or law to which one may associate, empirically, it's hard to deny the following. Despite some successful regional human rights courts, governments are, in the aggregate, more likely to respond to criticism from their fellow governments, acting alone or through international organizations, than they are from the report of a treaty monitoring committee even a special rapporteur, a human rights court, or an NGO. Now, of course, reports by regional and human rights, human rights expert bodies, courts, and NGOs can galvanize civil society and prompt change from below. But governmental leaders and the people of a state do not want to be named and shamed by other states. Officials do not want to find their visa requests for travel denied and their bank accounts blocked. So to return to Sri Lanka, our panel knew that our expert recommendations, we were, of course were not political actors, needed follow-up by the UN's political organs. And we were thus quite disappointed when Secretary General Ban Ki-moon did not endorse our recommendations, but simply forwarded them to the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Yet while one political actor decided to pass the buck, um, another grabbed it, in this case, um, fortuitously, uh, the American ambassador to the Human Rights Council who made it her cause to get a resolution through the Human Rights Council to prod the Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan government on accountability. After the Council passed that resolution, we would be able to see the beginnings of some movement within that country. Now, of course, it's impossible to know whether the political condemnation from the Council, and of course, from leaders of the Commonwealth as well, led to the electoral defeat of President Rajapaksa in 2015, but it certainly did not help Sri Lanka's standing to have been the subject of such international concern 
for its abhorrent actions in the Civil War. Now, the double standard criticism, in my view, does, however, have some bite with respect to one mode of enforcing human rights, namely the Security Council. For the veto, of course, can prevent the Council, which is the only body authorized to impose binding global sanctions from acting against one of the P5. Um, now, the Council has still managed to pass many resolutions, but of course, as Sam pointed out, um, the veto has inhibited the Council from taking some significant action to protect human rights, whether the never deployed mission that military experts believe would have stopped the Rwandan genocide to the actual and threatened veto by Russia and China of even modest sanctions on Syria. That paralysis in the face of gross human rights abuses, not the double standard itself, makes the current practice regarding the veto unjust in my view. For the veto's deployment eliminates a mode of protecting human rights against the worst sort of atrocities. Well, what are our options? One proposal made by my colleague Anna Peters is to require Security Council members to justify their veto when they cast it. Well, the only problem with this idea is that members can always come up with reasons and not only bad ones. When Russia vetoed the resolutions on security on Syria in 2012, it said it wanted to avoid a repeat of the Libyan situation, which as Sam described, in which case the Security Council's authorization to use force for the protection of civilians was interpreted by NATO to allow them to oust the Gaddafi regime. So perhaps a cynical argument deployed by Russia, but in a sense quite effective and principled at the same time. <coughs> to me, the most promising solution in the real world to address this injustice lies in the proposed discussion, proposal made to the General Assembly a few years ago to limit the use of the veto in cases where the Council is considering action to stop large-scale killings, precisely that sort of action for which it was given res special responsibility under the R2P doctrine. Now, the states proposing this limitation ended up withdrawing their proposal because of the P5 opposition. Um, and of course, the Assembly can't order the, P the Council to do anything. But it could have been a start of a set of different expectations that might have swayed conversations in the Council. Now, some of you might think, why not just eliminate the veto to eliminate both the paralysis and the double standards? Um, now, I don't think the veto's elimination will eliminate double standards because the member states on the Council will still be acting in their national interest. But I actually want to give a slightly different argument, which is that um, comes from my view of the nature of what international law can do to promote global justice. Um, and here I both agree and disagree with some of the comments made by Sam. Um, in my view, in a world in which international and interstate and internal peace cannot be taken for granted, I see the preservation of peace and the avoidance of war as a major pillar of global justice, not an opposition to global justice, but a component of it, along with the protection of human rights. Um, as a result, I think we have to ensure that international institutions have the capacity to address the threat and reality of war. And the Council's responsibility is indeed to respond to the threats to the peace and breaches of the peace. To do that, I think the Council has to include the most powerful states, those with the capacity to exercise some influence over those who fight, threaten to fight, or fund interstate or internal wars. And all things being equal, the Council's resolutions are likely to be far more effective at promoting peace if they have the support, and especially not the active opposition, of those states. So on these consequentialist grounds for the preservation of peace, the veto indeed has a moral justification. It's not just a political imperative from 1945, but it has an independently justifiable content. So that, alas, makes the veto justifiable in the non-ideal world where states have unequal power. But it also means that to preserve the peace comes at a cost for the enforcement of human rights by the Council. Thus, justifying my insistence on limitations on the use of the veto. Now, I don't live in a fantasy world where the Council's members will suddenly start fulfilling their responsibilities, including those to those suffering human rights abuses, but I'm also concerned that if we remove the veto, it will actually make matters worse. Um, these remarks, then, about persuasion and politics, I hope reinforce our Tanner lecturer's belief that the human rights system is neither defunct, nor illegitimate, nor hegemonic, nor merely bureaucratic, nor a poor substitute for more profound changes to the global order. Instead, it's a highly imperfect system that reflects the states that develop and control it, but in my view, in the hands of skilled experts, advocates, 
civil servants, diplomats, and perhaps most importantly, politicians, can still improve the lives and dignity of those who most need it. Thanks very much. Thank you all for very different perspectives. And I think that um, I want to give Radhika just a couple minutes here to collect her thoughts. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will, in the meantime, reintroduce you to our keynote speaker from last night, the Turner Lecture in 2017. I first heard Radhika's name in the early 1990s when she was appointed a special rapporteur on uh, women, violence against women. Um, this was shortly before the Beijing Conference of 1995, at a time when people were questioning whether women's rights were indeed human rights and whether human rights were indeed women's right. Uh, and so the appointment of a special rapporteur to take on this particular area of work had, uh, was a great moment for activists in the international human rights movement. Um, in this capacity, she served for nine years in this capacity, she reported to the human, what was then the Human Rights Commission, on matters that related to a wide range of concerns uh, for women's rights, including domestic violence, rape, trafficking, uh, and exploitation, and then violence against women in situations of armed conflict. She went on then, after uh, these nine years, to work um, as UN Under Secretary General, Special Representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations, on children and armed conflict. People often think about women and children or want to think about women and children in the same breath, but she was looking particularly at the situation where women and children were very rarely put together, children in armed, in armed conflict. So she took on the, the cause of, um, of child soldiers, as it were. In both of these assignments, as she indicated last night, she spent uh, many uh, hours, many days, many months in the field talking to people who had both suffered abuses and participated in the systems that produced the, uh, the abuses. And she brought countless stories to the attention of the United Nations and other, other multilateral bodies. And so it's, it's not really surprising that in 2014-15, uh, as the United Nations was preparing to review a couple of its major commitments, one, uh, Resolution 1325 on the role of women in peace, and then the high-level panel on peace operations, that she was involved in not one, but both of these. You led the, the review of 1325 and participated in the, the what's known as the Hippo Report. So she's been, in many ways, at the center of conversations in the United <coughs> Nations about how the peace and human rights uh, bodies actually function, including their dysfunction, I'm, mm. I'm quite sure. Um, in addition to the work at the United Nations, she has also been involved in her home country of Sri Lanka, where she served as the chairperson of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission from 2003 to 2006, and where she was a director of the International Center for Ethnic Studies from 1984 to 2006. So she's been involved in the dynamics, um, political dynamics of human rights in Sri Lanka. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Kumaraswamy has also, can also be considered a much decorated academic. She holds honorary doctorates from a long list of universities. Today she uh, teaches at New York University School of Law, where she's a global professor of law teaching courses on women's international human rights and children and armed conflict. Um, we are looking forward to your comments you. now in response to our panelists. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if this is working. Yeah. But um, 
just to say that I'm no longer teaching at NYU. I've gone back to Sri Lanka and I've been put on the Sri Lankan Constitutional Council, so I'm now really full-time uh, back uh, in Sri Lanka. Great. Though I miss academia a lot, I must say. <laughs> so let me say that, um, let me begin by first thanking my three fellow panelists for really, really interesting uh, comments. And um, when I revise my uh, 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 lecture for final publication, a lot of what they say I will take into account and, uh, and try and uh, uh, do it. Um, what I, first to begin with David, you know, what I've always loved about David's writing and conversations with David is the kind of skepticism he brings to uh, settled uh, knowledge, especially people with settled outrage. And I was thinking, think of him often when sometimes, especially in the violence against women movement, you suddenly the movement changed somewhere I can't remember. I think it was uh, around 2001 from being a very human rights and kind of victim-oriented movement to this kind of law and order prosecution movement with all these celebrities suddenly turning up and, you know, it was all very different. That was not the kind of violence against movement that we began. And that kind of certainty, the outrage, uh, the talking points, um, and that is not the kind of human rights uh, that we had grown up with, and, and that's why I think um, when David calls for more skepticism and for more, for more reflection on, on what we're doing and how we're doing it, I, I completely agree both with him and uh, Professor Moy. Now, when I, yeah, talking about humanism, uh, he said, well, what is at the core? It, for me, it was not only compassion, it's also um, he must have seen the first version of my speech because I revised it. <laughs> the, uh, the second version I mentioned that at the because I felt that that didn't quite capture it. The, it was also the human rights concepts of freedom, equality, and justice, as well as compassion. You know, because justice is at the core uh, of a lot of uh, the humanist stories uh, emanating from around the world. And also in the paper, I mentioned uh, that in Africa and Asia, the concepts of dignity and um, and I think um, that there is a, a, a resonance in all societies uh, with regard to all these concepts uh, and I would differ with both Kennedy and um, uh, Professor Moyne uh, to say that that's something not to highlight or to emphasize. Um, I think we have to begin there otherwise the rest doesn't really uh, uh, make sense, or it will always be a discussion about power, which I would prefer human to, to, to recognize power, but also that perhaps we can have discussions about something else, but I'll get to that um, as well. The second point he me uh, made was that really human rights um, uh, and the sort of emphasis on uh, um, the present human rights, uh, the localism, uh, the pluralism, maybe those are the alternatives rather than universality in the UN, um, et cetera. And David, I think, has a preference for that. But I think the argument by um, that, the work that Sally Mary Engel has done on violence against uh, women around the world show that the encounter between the international and the national, uh, interacting and spinning off each other, actually creates for far more dynamic movements. Um, and she points to various countries. And the differences in local situations on how countries deal with domestic violence depending on culture, etc. But she points to the dynamic, that actually without the international, the national would have no strength. Uh, and without the national, the international would have no depth. Um, so I think we have to see it as a dialectic rather than find umbrella uh, in either of the other. And that, I think, is the key to understanding international norms or human rights, that it's, uh, it's that dialogue. I, mean, I think Sally captures it best. And I think, of course, violence against women is one area which was such a grassroots movement and came to the UN as a grassroots movement. Perhaps it's most successful there. Uh, but it's, it, I think it's telling uh, uh, her analysis. Um, so I think, uh, I uh, would prefer to see it that way, uh, and not so much uh, 
as localism or, or internationalism. Then about the subaltern voice, uh, you know, human rights is crowding us all out. Where is the subaltern voice? You know, we can't have a voice just for the sake of a voice. There was a, a point in my colleagues writing about subaltern voices where I think, I can't, what is the novel in which the person in the wheelchair, Mrs. Mr. Rochester, had a wife in the attic? Huh? Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. So there was a critique of Jane Eyre from a third world perspective, and uh, they said that the wife who was locked up in the, um, uh, in the home should be given a voice, uh, which I agree, but it was also combined with a critique on reason because she was suffering from mental illness. So who is, can she really speak for herself at the United Nations? I mean, you, I think that's what I'm saying. I'm saying voice for the, just for the sake of a voice where someone, um, and that person has always to speak when even they can't or they don't want to, they would prefer that you two, you two, um, isn't that also something we should think about? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, um, uh, and often that's the situation we find. If I'm in Central African Republic, those women turn up in Geneva, they, they won't know what to do and they really don't want to go there. You know? So that is the question for international uh, intermediaries, as you say. Um, we give voice to the voiceless, but the voiceless themselves and uh, the fact that many argue that they should speak for themselves, that has its limits uh, in certain contexts uh, and uh, in certain, and if you want the best for them. Uh, and that may result in certain kind of pat patronizing situations, but I think as uh, Steve said, we have to see what is the practice. Some of these women will speak, uh, but some, will be completely re-traumatized. I saw, I saw some horrific thing yeah, the other day when uh, George Clooney's wife, what's her? Amal. She took some poor girl who had been gang raped and whatever from the, uh, one of the communities in Syria and was on CNN being interviewed by, um, by um, oh, what's, uh, I can't, one of the interviews and she was completely completely traumatized, she, word couldn't come out. It was an absolutely humiliating moment for her and a very painful moment for all of us. So I think this, this is something we have to think about as someone who's been very involved in the human rights movement. Victims don't just get up and speak. Yeah, it's a very, very, very uh, long process uh, and they have to be, uh, you have to talk to them, you have to uh, make sure that they're healed uh, you know, before you put them on CNN for sure. Um, so that's, that's one thing I have to say about the voices. I think at times there have to be the uh, intermediaries uh, and the uh, and human rights people sometimes are trained to do that. Um, then David, to, on um, your attitude to the UN is basically what works, do what works, be practical, you know, okay. Um, but to me, uh, what Upendra Bakshi also said uh, in, his, in his writings on human rights, human rights is also a way uh, to record pain and suffering and to force yourself and everyone else to feel that pain and suffering. Um, and so it's more than practical, it's also a recording of that pain. Uh, uh, and I think um, that is what is extremely important uh, in all those affidavits that uh, people, experts and others have can, taken in the United Nations. Uh, if you want to record them or you go through what's gone in the courts, it's, it's a recording of that pain and suffering. And the moment human rights leaves that, leaves that link to a pain and suffering or poverty, then it becomes an instrument of governance. Uh, and then only it becomes a handmaiden of dominance. Uh, so, so I think uh, it's not only what is practical, but also that it's strongly linked, as Yupin says, to the narrative of pain, suffering, and suffering. Um, I think um, they, it is true that human rights uh, is, all, is, a, is, is emancipatory pr uh, promise, 
But there's a whole other area of human rights that you see in war that you don't see uh, when you talk about human rights, which we are used to, and that's protection. Um, only people who work with ICRC and others will immediately understand that. That's not human rights, really. That's humanitarian. The protection of civilians and the protection of people. And it is only in that context, uh, and it also goes to the point uh, that Steve made, that we contemplate or see uh, issues relating to the use of, or presence. We prefer to call it a presence of force uh, to pr pr protect uh, civilians. So this link between emancipation, human rights as emancipa emancipation, and humanitarianism that asks for protection. That's because I remember when I first went into this field, you know, for women's rights, to use the word pr protect was considered completely um, uh, patriarchal. You know, we don't need to be protected; we are emancipated. But the discourse of protection comes out of the humanitarian discourse to protect women and children and civilians during times of war. So we have to see that equation uh, as well. Um, uh, now, uh, with regard to how to read Althusser, Foucault, and Nietzsche with caution, both uh, Professor Moyne and, I mean, you know, I actually love these, uh, I don't like Althusser, but I'm a great fan of both Nietzsche and Foucault. Uh, but just to say that uh, uh, to read these uh, people with caution, um, uh, and remind, they're just telling you about a long list of worries, uh, Etc. I agree, that's true. They, they highlight and allow us to analyze institutions and structures and individuals, and we must use their tools. But then using them as a guidance for political or moral action, I think, can be interesting. I mean, after all, we must realize that Foucault ended his life as a supporter of Ayatollah Khomeini. You know? He went off to Iran. Now, that's the logic that his uh, philosophy, that's where that took him. Right, so, so you know, we have to worry about the because uh, after all, that was the final uh, uh, questioning of the Enlightenment, the Ayatollah, you know. And then there's some others who are now for sultanates, you know. I mean, um, very good friends of mine. I think they've gone back from that. But there was a phase where to fight the Enlightenment, you the, surely that's what I'm saying. The analysis is great, but where does this lead us? Right, where are you going with this? Uh, what is the practical consequences? Uh, and I completely uh, uh, agree that we should use them for analysis and understanding of what is wrong, the worries, and the caution. But when people began to begin to use their ideas for political action, um, I really uh, worry. But uh, but I think the person who finally, uh, who is a postmodernist and who comes out of a great understanding of these schools, she coined the phrase of uh, strategic essentialism, as you know, Gayatri Spivex, realizing that in certain contexts, even if our analysis leads us away, that human rights is important to, uh, in, for, for, um, as a, as, as a to be essentialist about human rights um, for strategic reasons, to protect people, to help empower people, or for fight for people. I think that is a crucial word for those who are great believers of these philosophers who don't accept um, the kind of a natural law theory uh, of uh, human rights uh, that she decides. That, I think, is, a, is where I would uh, direct it. And uh, most, a lot of me is there, but a part of me is, is with Bakshi. So that's what I have, David, for you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if I can talk to, uh, talk to Professor Moyne. So let me begin by completely agreeing with your ending, which is that, um, and I am actually going to change a little bit of my talk uh, to bring that out more. First, that um, the, one of the greatest things we need now is the right to peace. Uh, and my global study uh, on women, peace, and security that we did in 2015 uh, made that as a big point, um, and the need uh, to revive the Women for Peace movements around the world and to fund them, um, uh, because it was crucial, we felt. And it, actually, there was a huge Women for Peace conference as part of this rewriting of, uh, of the Security Council that took place in Amsterdam. Um, 
And the second part that I also completely agree is the need to uh, go back uh, to economic and social rights and equality and distribution, which is something uh, which has been ignored for over 20 years. I was very much a part of, as a young person, the NIEO and the Third World discussions around that. And then, of course, what happened uh, was uh, globalization and, um, and within Sri Lanka, my own country, you know, uh, we impoverished ourselves with import substitution and all the kind of policies that we thought, uh, we had a Trotskyist Minister of Finance and suddenly we were very poor and our neighbors like Singapore and Taiwan and they were now leaping at uh, you know, 20% growth rates and 17% growth rates and is going into the modern world in such uh, dramatic form that everybody was then lost uh, kind of what, what is, where should we go now, you know, in the sense that obviously the old formula uh, was not right uh, and surely the neoliberal formula can't be right because it's called causing such great inequalities but so what is right? Um, what is the mix? Uh, these are still discussions we're having um, because what happened is after uh, all these what they call the tigers of Asia, Boston, you know, South Korea, Singapore just boomed into the 21st century. Now China uh, using neoliberal policies, it became all our governments in Sri Lanka, whether they were capitalist or leftist, began to do have the same policies. Uh, and it is only now with this vast inequality that is now appearing everywhere, not only uh, in the United States, but even in my own country because of following these policies uh, that people um, are rethinking uh, the inequality and the need for social, uh, new constitution will have a strong social and economic rights section, uh, which was something the Indians used very effectively in the 1970s, you know, right to education, uh, right to housing, South Africa. And there's a whole history of litigation in South Africa and India on all these uh, social and uh, economic rights, but which slowed down, uh, mainly because of this uh, massive neoliberal success of Asian uh, tigers, as they call them, uh, at that time. But now, because of the inequality, people uh, are rethinking. And when you have uh, Christine Lagarde of the United Na uh, of the IMF talking about inequality and coming to Sri Lanka and saying you must do something about the inequality. Uh, I find it very strange because that word was rarely used for 20 years. I think it was Occupy Wall Street movement that first used it after many, many years, the 1% or uh, whatever. So um, I think those two issues, war and distribution, um, are definitely uh, two of the very important human rights issues um, of, the, of the future. Um, and I also agree with uh, Professor Moyne that, as I said earlier, that this victim is, you know, it, ha it has to be in a much more nuanced way. It's true that the voice, uh, not every voice can speak, but it's also true that you just can't prep people with talking points and have them, I have want to, I have taken down Af Af people coming before me and you know, they say the same thing, five people in a row. You know. So obviously they've been prepped by the NGO to say the same thing. You know. So that kind of, and they're full of outrage and you know, it's all false uh, and sensational. Uh, and that I think we should uh, also uh, move, move away from. But where I uh, disagree with you of course is with regard to uh, humanism and the UN, um, with regard to um, humanism, you mentioned uh, anth introductory anthropology. Well, you know, the 1947 famous, what is that, declaration of the American Association of Anthropology, which now all of them uh, absolutely uh, have put under and pretend it doesn't exist, uh, claimed that there were no universal values and we should have uh, any culture is, uh, every, is, uh, is unique and uh, everything should be. And they have actually now abandoned that uh, declaration. So um, that is no longer introduction, anthropology, introductory course. 
<laughs> so, um, and as you say, every culture we know values lie. There are a whole host of issues. And you have to understand why human rights has resonance. I mean, wherever I go, they'll talk. Immediately you mention their eyes light up. They have a sense of resonance. So if there's resonance, there has to be something there. Um, uh, and, I, uh, and I think um, uh, even Edward Said, whom I quoted, says, you know, wh what else, for intellectuals, what else is there to do but to see how we can find to express that humanism in the context uh, of today's world. Um, uh, and re with regard to the UN, you know, in the way it is true, it is, a, a, it is an imperfect place, of course. Uh, and it is also true that it is, uh, states are very powerful. And I remember we were at a prominent thing, and one of the five perm permanent five members said, you know, we can't do this, it's the states. That are. And then I pointed to the charter, and I said, it says, we the people. That's how the charter begins. It's not uh, we the states. Um, and so from that, the people comes human rights comes all those treaties on, uh, that have been around the world, uh, been written on women's rights, children's rights, genocide, all that. That's, not, that's about protecting people. That's not about protecting states. Um, and so I think that's what we must emphasize. You know, The states have tried to take over the UN completely by saying this is a state body. But if you read the charter, it is we the people after scourge of war, et cetera, have created this institution. It's we the peoples. Peoples, yes. <laughs> Somewhat yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, but still, there's a diversity, but it's not states, right? Unless states represent peoples. But that's, that's one step away. <laughs> um, so then, um, so, so um, I think uh, uh, not that the UN is perfect, but I think it can be a very enormously important tool. And um, I don't know about reclaiming human rights from the UN because, you know, to me, if I take my own country, uh, everything plays a complementary role. And nobody is acting on their own. Now, during the worst time uh, of, the, uh, of the war, when there was so much repression, they have a very local civil rights groups collecting the data. But if they said a word, that would, they'd be dead, or they would be arrested, or in some white van. So then who, they would give it to people who would go abroad and would then find its way to the UN, uh, et cetera. And, it's and then the UN agencies, as your report, after his, uh, their report, the UN, I was there at the meeting, it was decided that actually if you have too much human rights pressure on the government from the local UN, uh, the uh, government will then take it out on the population and deny you humanitarian access. So that's a little dangerous too. So the decision was made that if any human rights issues come, it'll be now from the future discussed from New York. Uh, and that, and the, the ground has to deal with the humanitarian uh, issues. So, so I'm just saying that it's not like taking anything away from everyone. It's like everyone working together where one it's possible. Now, these local human rights people in Sri Lanka, um, you know, the people gave their affidavits only because they thought it was going to the UN. Uh, so, uh, and they were not really funded by anyone. No one dared fund these people. Uh, uh, so this, these were, you know, uh, people who did it because they thought injustice was being done, uh, and the church, etc. So I think um, we have to see the UN as on one aspect of a more global, uh, a more complicated and nuanced process uh, of human rights, especially in situations uh, of emergency. Um, and in the end, the evidence ends up there. But the collecting of the evidence, the protecting of the victims, getting people out of the country, uh, uh, protecting the ones in the country, all that is a much more complicated uh, affair. Uh, and the UN is only one of the actors, but a very major actor. Uh, you know, The fact that a debate is coming up on your country uh, is important. And the, and the fact that 
he would come and make such a silly statement about the language. You know, at least you're asking them these questions. You know. To sit there at, this, at CEDO and to be asked questions, um, any country, I don't know any of you have been to the convention on the elimination of discrimination against women, the country is there, and they're, they're the most uh, extraordinary women experts are chosen, and they are now questioning and interrogating for four hours the state on their female gender practices. These are all part of the process of uh, protecting uh, human rights. So, but the problem, if you want to know with the United Nations is, to me, as finally, uh, is the Security Council. So that is the problem. The other, of course, maybe a lot of bureaucracy, and we can do a lot of reform uh, to less spend less money and all that. That's part of managing bureaucracies. But the problem with the, is the Security Council. And the example that you all mentioned is Libya, where the, the UN humanitarian agencies pointed to uh, imminent uh, danger and death to million, uh, about a million people in Benghazi and managed to persuade even Russia and China that this was going to happen. Uh, and uh, the Security Council passed an R2P resolution, but then NATO just took it over. And uh, I think the African Union was just expecting the citizens of, of Benghazi to be protected and then just for them to begin negotiations with Gaddafi. Um, so the d dangers, the Security Council really, uh, its processes and uh, such things are the ones if we really want to reform the UN, that's where uh, we have to, to look at. Finally, I think a lot of this discussion is human rights and law on one hand versus politics. And you know, the Althusser, Foucault, and Zizek, and even maybe Kennedy and Moyne uh, come out on politics over, uh, over sort of generalized laws. Um, but I think really we need both. I think we cannot give up the notion, which many people wanted to in the 90s, of independent, objective, truth, decision making. Uh, if you give that up, uh, I, I know from my own country, there's utter disaster. There has to be a belief um, that there can be truth of some sort. <laughs> I may be a nuanced truth, but some truth, some objective, um, independent uh, decision making. Um, and as Upendra Bhakshi used to say, the, the courts in India, by doing uh, social and economic rights, he always argued uh, it was the only way India would avoid violence, that the courts had become the nonviolent uh, way of resolving issues of economic and social justice. So um, I feel unless, especially in many parts of the world, if you have politics um, that is just raw politics and just based on power, um, there will be a lot of violence and injustice. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, those comments. You have We've touched on quite a number of, of points, and I think the, the various comments that have been made um, help us reflect on all the different ways in which the human rights paradigm, if there is a single paradigm, um, shapes the way that people have tried to solve some of the, the most challenging um, circumstances that they face. And I, I was reflecting at, during your, your comments, uh, Radhika, about a trip that I made to Colombia in the late 1990s, in which um, Amnesty International was having a bit of difficulty with its local group. Mm -hmm. in, and we were trying to decide whether it was actually in a position to remain functional as a human rights organization. And I remember a rather impassioned conversation with local activists who were not necessarily well-grounded well either in philosophy or law, but saw the human rights language as being, um, as, as offering them a way to shape some of what they felt was a claim to dignity um, uh, 
in their situation. And they said something like, are you saying to us, you the international human rights movement, are you saying to us that human rights is a concept, is a notion that we can use only in times of peace when what we need it most for is in times of war, mm. what we're li uh, living through right now. It seems to me that in various ways we've kind of come around to, um, many of the comments kind of circle back to the, that kind of a, an understanding. We've arrived at the moment here where we can open up the floor to questions for our panelists and for our speaker. Liz. Yeah. Um, I think it was Sam who uh, raised the question of what are human rights advocates for? And I was very struck by that. Um, when I teach political philosophy, I can tell my students when you find a really big concept like democracy or equality or human rights, the most important question to ask is who are they against? Who are the advocates of this big, big normative idea against? And that usually once you can identify what you're against, you have a much sharper idea <laughs> of, of what the movement's about. And I think Radhika, in her talk, articulated that sense that Human rights starts from outrage at, at brutality, at cruelty, at the imposition of suffering through rape, torture, all kinds of horrors. And as well as poverty. <laughs> yes, all kinds of all kinds of suffering that could be avoided. <laughs> and what it does is it appeals then to some emotions that can be found in everyone, no matter what culture they belong to. And it tries to rally people in recognition that it doesn't matter what your you know what your race or your ethnicity or gender or nationality is, you can feel compassion and outrage on behalf of the victims of these outrages, these cruelties, these gratuitous forms of suffering. And then it attempts to rally, both mobilize everyone's sense that they're capable of extending those, those feelings to anyone, any human being, and tries to rally all human beings around the world around that fundamental opposition. Now, of course, then what you do about it, then we bring ourselves to David's point that, and also Steve was pointing this out, that okay, how do you how do you end <laughs> this these outrages? Well, that <clears throat> is an instrumental question that has to be highly attentive to the conditions. to David and Steve, did I? Um, and also enormous amounts of experimentation with institutional design. We don't know, we're constantly exploring those things. Um, so I think there's, there is both, a, there is a universal foundation in certain human capacities for response to victims, no matter what their social identity. Mobilizing that then, though, requires attention to local conditions, local resources, some of which are ideological, institutional, and so forth. And at least that's the way I see the way, the sort of tension between univers the universality is so important because being able to appeal to a worldwide movement can put pressure on local actors that might not otherwise be there. Um, but that's not at all to deny that, that as far as coming up with solutions, it's got to be highly attentive to global realities. Could I answer that? And also, I, I, I didn't deal with some of the issues uh, Professor Ratner uh, had raised. So 
first, let me just say that this outrage, um, you know, when I was children in armed conflict and I was uh, in the Security Council, we have, uh, there is a working group on children in armed conflict and we look at specific countries and some of the issues um, and then get a resolution or some recommendations either to the government or we, s we publish a notice in the country to the rebels um, and the Security Council has to agree. Now to lobby on some things, uh, I had to meet the ambassadors uh, of these countries and I will tell you without any reservation, every one of them, of course it's not their country, right? I mean, that's a different story. If it was their country, they might have other, whether it's Chinese or Russian, you know, Mr. He died recently. Uh, or, um, Turkin. Turkin. Uh, and the others, you know, there's horror on their face when you show them or discuss certain issues, you know? It, it was, it's so, there, there is that sense of outrage and a need to do something, especially on children. And that's one issue you can always uh, get. But then I think the issue that um, Professor Ratner uh, mentioned is the normative intermediaries. Now you take this outrage and then what do you do with it? Um, and of course the UN system then has these normative intermediaries, uh, whether it's special rapporteurs or um, uh, states themselves or NGOs, uh, whatever. Now, I myself was a special representative and a special rapporteur, and you, it was interesting that you said, um, you know, instead of talking about law and accountability, it's better to talk to them about humanitarian and political and economic issues, and that's true. Now, for example, when I was in Mindanao and talked talk to the rebels there, now, these were really interesting rebels. They reminded me of the old Trotskyites of Sri Lanka, you know, with that sort of bush. Uh, it's very intellectual. Um, and, uh, you know, if you discussed humanitarian issues with them and moral and uh, political issues, they came around. In the end, they did sign a peace agreement. And, um, you know, what they came to us is, look, the problem is that uh, the children are in our villages. So if our villages are attacked, the children uh, fighting back with us, you know, so this is not like recruitment, like the IRA, you know, so, so it was a very interesting conversation, um, and uh, uh, anyway, they signed a PC, I think things are going all right in Mindanao, so one didn't even need to get to law and uh, whatever, you know, there were other ways, UNICEF then uh, dealt with the children in the schools and whatever, but there are some people where, you know, you just, you know, there was some rebel in the Central African Republic who was sort of arrived with a ch I mean, really, impunity talk about it. He arrives with 12-year-olds with guns for the meeting. <laughs> I mean, you know, so then, of course, uh, talk. And if you mention the Security Council, everybody gets, uh, I told the Security you don't. you do not understand the power that you have. The Security, the mention of the word Security Council or the ICC people actually look up and look uh, a little nervous, and this this commandant, as he called, who arrived on a kind of a donkey with these young soldiers, and who looked really quite uh, unstable. Uh, so uh, in the end, uh, just said, you know, look, if you go on this way, you, you just end up before the International Criminal Court, and that's that, and whatever. Which not true because Central African Republic is a lie, but still. Uh, in the end, uh, so he did. He handed over 600 children to us, to UNICEF. But he also wanted my phone number, which was very nerve-wracking. But <laughs> he had a, you know, he absolutely uh, did. So you know, these kinds of uh, those kinds of people, Coney and those kind of commandants, you have to, you have to, uh, I think, be a little firm with. Uh, but uh, I think there are others, uh, such as the rebels of Mindanao and. I'm sure rebels in many parts of the world, uh, in um, uh, some of the uh, uh, Tutsi rebels, etc. They were, you know, you could have a conversation, and they wanted to do what was best for the country and things like that. So the intermediary then has to decide what to use, depending on the nature of the f people he's dealing with. I think. I don't know if you agree, Steve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm.
Department of Philosophy organized this event. And I'm really appreciate also that another name is Radhika uh, Komaraswami. Um, specifically, one part of your comments I heard that way with them do not talk or could not have a chance to talk. Therefore, this uh, human right movement protect women and children have the big challenge and dilemma of that has never been completely solved. So which brought up my question to you and the panel. Uh, in relation of this specific case that you mentioned about that, philosophically I would say this is the problem from a technical point of view, what we understand of uh, what we're today, the one of the challenges between the data and the noise. The what, sorry? And the noise. Noise. Okay. The data and the noise. So, the, yeah. the the, yes, yes. For all the women in Gary, the screaming, could hear it. Yes. If you hear the half of you talk, and she doesn't want to talk, you get noise. I'm okay, nothing happened. So this is considered before the data is uh, noise. If I can make it three, three things. Here in another 2014, a black woman, prostitute and um, drug abuser, that's the number nine, been killed by the police. Before that, a huge amount of noise. But how many people get that? Same thing is in China. The highest leader have more women, more pleasure. But the second day you walk out in jail for good. Who heard those noises of the victims? Thirdly, of the one million women march. Suddenly, one million people over there. How much noise have you heard? Well, I see, I couldn't believe that they could do it without police arresting, abuse, or not abuse, criticized. Uh, Trump. So what am I point on making that if what you mentioned that if you try to make sense is that in reality is the way we are trying to do a fundamental problem because of technology, because so easy that the data, especially big data, but we really ignore the major information come up very beginning is noises. And then that's the difference between the grassroots, the ordinary people, and versus the educated people, the leaders, elite, whatever it is, gap is bigger and bigger. So that's my point. Do you agree with me? Or my understanding is more emotional rather than reality? If what I say makes some sense, how we are going to solve this problem actually every day? The women, the folk that waited, put the bomb on the bar, put, put it, you know, go there, go. Uh, more and more. Because they want to make more noise than nobody can hear. So therefore, they make bigger noise and use the body. Use the weapon to kill themselves and others. So that's the point. If you could help. <laughs> You're all looking at me. <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, one of the things you raise is the issue of noise that's uh, around especially sexual violence. And the interesting thing uh, we found was that uh, on the one hand, you have this issue where real victims don't come forward, uh, don't want to speak. I went to Rwanda right after the genocide into the commune of Taba, where the case of Akiyesu took place, where this, this uh, mayor really just called in the interham way and, all, uh, and the women who sought sanctuary there were very, very brutally raped. And, and those uh, women, very hard to speak, very frightened and timid, uh, in fact, one of them uh, um, testified uh, in Arusha, and when I went to see her after the test, after she testified, she said she was shivering, and I, and I said why? She said because Akiesu 
who was seated in front of her was making all these Rwandan hand singles, signals, which were very threatening and, and, uh, uh, and gross. Um, but nobody else knew, I mean, the international court. Uh, and so and now I think they put the, uh, um, in all these international courts, the uh, defendant sits at the back after this, uh, this case. But anyway, um, so that's how a real victim is, normally timid, terrified, frightened. Um, but then you also have the male leaders as well as female leaders of these movements sometimes um, in various war zones exaggerate the number of women um, who are victims of um, sexual violence so as to get international sympathy. So any kind of person reporting on this issue, you have to, as you say, separate the noise from the data. What is the exaggeration, what is not? Um, and of course, uh, to do that, you have to have really reliable and trustworthy local uh, activists, uh, as well as you know, organizations like uh, UNICEF and others who are on the ground. I mean, I was telling somebody, wherever I went in the world, um, there were always uh, two institutions that were present, at, at least in Africa. One was the Catholic Church and the other was UNICEF. Uh, so uh, so in those are people who gather um, information and collect them as well. So I think in that sense, um, uh, you are right. There is sometimes so much noise that you don't know what the actual data is, especially on issues like sexual violence. Concern about how, where his work leads us, and maybe comfort you in that regard, like proposing you like a, a way to use Foucault to address one of the burning issues of our times. And I think that actually Foucault, Foucault's work can can be used to analyze or to try to understand what drone programs tells us tell us about how state power is exercised. Um, in the sense that their uh, permanence, the institutionalization of drone programs may intensify the way power is exercised over individuals. And this, for example, this reading I don't think is incompatible with a uh, human rights activists' agenda. I think it's just a different tool in order to understand a phenomenon, a specific phenomenon. And it comes back to Professor Moyne's uh, uh, idea that human rights may not be the ideal framework to uh, understand certain uh, phenomena. And maybe I, I would like to raise uh, some concerns uh, with the fact of rejecting Foucault, because um, I don't think that denying that individuals are docile bodies, as, as Foucault called them, and denying that they are disciplined individuals I don't see how helpful it is to achieve the, the goals of the human rights law. And similarly, I don't see how uh, considering individuals are equipped with free will and reason help, on the contrary, to achieve the goals of uh, human rights. There may be several of you who want to respond yes. to this, so we will. Okay. I, well, I, I have nothing to add, really. Um, I think you make some important um, points about this. Um, I just, just in passing, as a historical matter, uh, even as Foucault endorsed the Iranian Revolution, he came out in favor of the international human rights movement. Uh, and there's a, a new book about him on this topic called Foucault and the Politics of Rights, which we'd have to you know, take seriously. My own view is that Foucault is like the human rights movement. It's not to be taken or left on block. It's a lot of things. Some are good, some are bad. I think you, you have a very important point to, to make about some of the limitations of Foucault, um, but it's the wrong approach. So um, I think Foucault explains very well why appeals to humanism make little sense. But 
it could still be the case that he doesn't tell us what he's for, that he's a crypto-normative thinker, just like David Kennedy. <laughs> and it, it turns out that, that when you, you take seriously Foucault's own theory of rights, it's completely a tactical theory. Um, and the question is then, well, pragmatism in the, in, to what end? Um, tactics for it as part of what battle or war? Um, and I think that's why some of these normative theorists we have, although I might disagree with some of their you know, focus, are, are very important to bring into the discussion um, so that we can get Foucault a part of, of, of the discussion without thinking he's like a, a biblical figure who with his work is like scripture. I guess I would add uh, one um, thought, although it's not about Foucault in particular, but about one part of, uh, of your intervention, which is about sort of the limits of human rights law and the limits of international law generally. I mean, I think that uh, uh, unless you're a total utopian, I think most uh, practitioners of it, both international law and international human rights law understand the limits of what that institution, process, form of argumentation can do to change the world. Um, and the choice of human rights law, which has been a choice, I agree with Sam, um, not to focus on grand redistribution um, or pacifism um, since the, you know, the modern movement of the beginning in the 1940s, um, is a choice. Um, but saying that you are not being, you're not going to pursue other agendas is not the same thing as saying that you're undermining those other agendas. And so the fact that lots of smart people go into human rights, I think David has shown, you know, there are now lots of smart people who are going into other ways of changing the world. And I think setting it up as a conflict um, is both empirically and normatively problematic. I, I also think that trying to cram too much in human rights law is also damaging. And so I'm actually quite skeptical about the right to peace as a human right. Because I think the human rights movement has a lot to do just to focus on the rights that are already in the covenants and in the U International Bill of Rights to be talking about a human right to peace. I think there are other institutions and other, even maybe other legal institutions, but certainly other non-legal institutions that should be focusing on peace. Um, and similarly, with respect to deep distributive justice, which also I think is better achieved by other international law mechanisms like trade or investment or other things rather than the human rights movement. Um, so I think we just have to be careful about um, accept, uh, um, the question of limitations as opposed to uh, the question of conflicts. Thanks. Yes. Um, um, let me first say that uh, you know, I, I, I am a fan of Foucault. I, I even wrote a huge article on discipline and punish and uh, whatever. And uh, I just uh, uh, worry that um, people, shall I say, misread him perhaps and follow the wrong uh, political action. That's all. But as an um, analytical uh, piece of work, he really does look, uh, he is a person for human emancipation, there's no doubt about his work on sexuality, or his, his foundation is to free people from systems uh, of oppression, whether it's uh, penal or, or mental health or sexual. So I'm not denying that. But I'm just saying that some of his challenges are, are then taken in a way that, um, that uh, um, challenge the Enlightenment, you see, in a way that then some of the positive things of the Enlightenment also get shoved under the, the bus. Um, but um, the second thing I want to say about the right to peace is, uh, you know, not as an individual right, but I think the ICC, isn't there one section of the ICC that has not been drafted, the uh, aggression? Never? They came up with a definition a couple of, about 2012 at a review conference. So there is, it is now within the, you know, it's, there has to be another set of approval, but it's in the statute now, the definition of aggression. But that's saying that aggression is a, crime for which individuals could be prosecuted. It's not the same thing, in my view, as saying that it's a human right that's been yeah. created. No, I would, it's a humanitarian, uh, uh, not so much a right, but a humanitarian principle, uh, which I think, uh, I, was, I think is important. But also I think um, what I was, we were talking is that uh, the, that, uh, you know, I think in the early, in the 60s and 70s in the United States and in my own country, 
human rights groups are very strongly part of peace movements, you know. Um, and I think uh, that link uh, has not been made uh, for many years uh, in many other parts of the country, the world, the link between human rights and, and peace movements, you know. Um, in fact, peace movements no longer exist anywhere, really, do they? Uh, when they were the most powerful movement when we were growing up, yeah. I, uh, I think. So that's, uh, that's what I think is really needed in the world, uh, uh, international peace movement. I thought, um, and the women that gathered in Amsterdam uh, were thinking that was one way of dealing with what was going on in the world, is to create, you know, women first got into the UN, first appeared in the UN, uh, 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 not for rights, but for peace in World War I. It was uh, Women for Peace movement that actually began uh, uh, in, uh, that joined Geneva as an NGO. Uh, so maybe to revisit that history and to rebuild that for some of the things that are still being discussed. I think there are actually some conversations, if not negotiations, underway to, to uh, curtail nuclear weapons yes, even yeah. as we speak. Yeah. Any other comments from this? Um, I found Professor Moore's responses very interesting. And I have a few questions around that. Yeah. Um, the first one is on humanism. Humanism. Um, it's sort of, um, it sounds like sort of like a haze that embodies uh, very different people holding sort of conflict in your views. And uh, Professor Moore is telling us, oh, humanists should tell us what they're for. And he said, radical is for human rights. And also radical later said, uh, human rights boils down to justice. And uh, first question is, uh, Professor Moore, what do you think uh, humanism really boils down, boils down to? And what do you think it really means? Second question is around the United, the United Nations. You gave a very critical account of the United Nations and said that UN should not anticipate what the victim, victims uh, have to say. And a radical gave a response, a very critical response, saying that, oh, in some cases, the victims are just so, so traumatized that they need someone to speak for them. And in those kind of circumstances, uh, what do you, should we just, for example, leave the victims as they are? Or what's your take on that? So, so I myself would avoid um, terms like humanism and justice without specification. So on their own, they're useless because they're too open textured. And so those who claim to stand for those need need some need to be nailed to, to down. Uh, you know, and 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 we need more specifics. Um, you know, I, I, so I, I'll, I'll connect my answer to your second question with a kind of response to uh, Professor Anderson. I'm just not as sure that there's a, 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 as much universality as other people seem to think, especially across time. Um, uh, uh, so it, it may be that there's, there's, there's some sense that violation is, is universal. Um, I don't think that um, what people think are the worst violations are cross-culturally and especially cross-temporally universal. And certainly poverty was never seen to be mm. an evil until about the 1790s, and an eradicable evil for sure. Um, so I, you know, in, in, uh, for that matter, trauma, the idea that violation leads to some kind of traumatized process is not something that was even believed within a, the, the narrow band of Western, uh, you know, countries until you know the later 19th century at the very earliest. It has its own very specific history as an idea about how humans respond to those violations. So, I, you know, I I want to take a much more tentative view about. Um, whether we should think of people primarily as victims, whether how we attend to them, um, and, and really be a lot more deferential. Um, in particular, because it seems as if we're so much at the beginning of attempts to define any kind of universal human creed. And we need a lot more honest elaboration of such visions um, 
because so many of them had been defined in worlds of you know unequal global power as to be you know I think treated with a lot of of, of tentative um, you know skepticism. We'll take one more. Yeah. I mean, on this point, I mean, whether or not there are universal, universal sort of humanitarian values, I mean, I, I don't know, but I mean, they teach these days in anthro, anthro sort of one on one, but in uh, Western culture, there's not that much emphasis on that. Or maybe it's just me, but I feel like the more I read about it, the more I feel like it's not that much emphasis on that. Or maybe it's just me, but I feel like it's not that much emphasis on that. Across the world, that sort of differences in how people behave and make inferences about differences in sort of values, right? Because uh, what a person does is a function of what they value and what they believe. Um, and so, even if you have, to take an example, even if everybody in the world agreed that uh, there was a, uh, a basic right to, um, a basic right for every person to have as much education as they could profitable use. If you have sort of different opinions about how much education that might be for sort of different people, you're gonna have you're gonna have very different very different very different very different policies and actions and things like that. So I mean I think the whole question of whether or not there are universal values um, is very closely sort of tied up with this question of how is it different? Are people's opinion over time and things like that? So you know, I mean, I myself am not inclined to, to sort of look at what people did or said in the 1700s and infer that they had very different values from me. I, I'm not sure I can tell exactly, but it's important because when you sort of deal with these questions about you know uh, uh, how to convince people, how to change their minds, one part of that might be appealing to common values. Another part might be to sort of identify where their, their opinions are very different from yours. Um, makes the problem hard, I think. Uh, so I'd be interested if people have a response to that. Well, let me say one thing. I don't think that there is a, a contradiction between uh, universal values and difference. Um, no, you, mean, know, sure. you, you know, you could have difference and also a universal intuition toward equality and justice and compassion, uh, etc. Um, I mean, one would. I mean, I think the word Ignatieff and all uses intuition, not values, with regard to humanism. But then, if you want to just cast all this aside, okay? There's no universal humanism. There are no universal values. There's no natural law. Da di da. Then we just go into the Richard Rorty mode and say, well, okay, but still, 197 countries signed the charter and you gave your consent. Um, and now we're talking about dialogue and we're talking about consultation and discussion. You gave your consent to these values and these rights and you're bound, them, and you're bound by them. So we go then, okay, we can move us away from all that, you know, stuff if you want, though I still do feel there is a universal intuition toward this. And then just go to what David loves best, the practical. <laughs> and say, well, you all consented. You're bound by your consent. Forget what you did in the 17th century. You've now joined the United Nations. You've, uh, you've, you've, uh, you've signed the charter. You're paying money. People are giving uh, funding. Uh, so now, you know, you're bound by these norms. And not only that, they sign all the treaties and everything so uh, so then suddenly to say look these are not universal values um, you know it's, it, when you do something wrong suddenly you know like my government have signed every human rights uh, document in the world and then when they're challenged they said well you know it's a uh, human rights is, an a, is, is a western concept having now signed everything uh, uh, so you know in that sense I think it's no longer possible. That excuse is no longer possible. Right. So, so you're appealing then to a Consent. different value. You should keep your agreements or something, right? Yes. Yeah. If you, I, I mean, I prefer to argue the earlier way, but 
This is my fallback position. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's I mean, a great. Oh, oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead. I, I, I think I, I think you're. I mean, I think it's a great set of questions. And and again, I think for the for the for the person in the field who goes in there with what they regard as universal values, which are for the human rights practitioner is typically defined as what's in the universal bill. Um, they would like to be able to assume that the person on the other side of the table shares that value. But when they discover that they don't, they've got these other arrows in their quiver, right. which is this is tradition, this is basic, you know. So if you tell them, uh, well, you know, the, it, it, or if you were even thinking of telling them, well, you know, you, you can't have child soldiers under the Child's Rights Convention, and, uh, and then of course you realize they've never heard of the Child's Rights Convention, so there's no point in bringing that up. And then you say something like, well, um, there's an international consensus against child soldiers, and they say, but we practice, we've had child soldiers here for generations, so why should I care about that? And then you have to come up with some other argument, which is, well, um, you know, uh, over time this is going to lead to certain consequences for your group, and you're going to have, you know, different political problems and different economic problems. And, and even though the norm back there is a universal norm about child soldiers, at least nearly universal norm, um, I think the person in the field has to pull out whatever uh, whatever connects them to the other person, and even if their opinion is completely parochial. I think we are at that comment pretty much out of, out of time. The, these last sets of comments kind of take us back to the questions of philosophy and uh, its, it's uh, intersection with the politics, and uh, that's probably a conversation we could keep going for a long, long time. Thank you all, thank you. panelists, uh, and thank you for coming. Please uh, join me in thanking the panelists.